Good morning, and, and welcome to our fifth session of the Osher Summer Lecture Series entitled Critical Thinking for the Preservation of Democracy. Today's session is Individual Privacy. And once again, we are live streaming to five other Osher uh, affiliates at the University of Vermont in Burlington, Granite State College in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, University of Massachusetts at Boston, University of Georgia in Athens, and the University of Kentucky in Lexington. A few housekeeping notes, the usual ones. If you'd like to purchase CDs or DVDs of any of our sessions, please see Donna, who's out in the hallway past the uh, OSHA desk. Please turn off your cell phones or put them on silence or other devices. And if you need to leave during the session, please exit at the rear and not to the sides. And when we have the beginning of our 30-minute intermission, please bring your written questions down to the front so we can uh, sort them. And now I'd like to thank our underwriters and sponsors. The Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Caldwell Law, Dartmouth 250, Dartmouth Coach, Kendall at Hanover, Ledger Financial Advisors, Wells Fargo Advisors, and today's sponsor, Mascoma Bank. Let me now introduce our three guests. First speaker will be Jennifer Dasko. Jennifer is a professor of law at the Washington College of Law at American University in Washington, and she focuses on terrorism, national security, and criminal law. She got her bachelor's degree from Brown University, a master's from Cambridge as a Marshall Scholar, and a law degree from Harvard. While working in the US Department of Justice, she traveled to Tunisia and Kenya to which Guantanamo detainees had been released to verify that those countries were abiding by their promise to respect the detainees' human rights. During 2016 and 17, she worked at the Open Society Fellows as a, a fellow on issues related to privacy and law enforcement's access to data across borders. A fun fact about Jennifer, after today's session, she's traveling to the White Mountains is going to be uh, hiking on the Appalachian Trail for a couple of days. <laughs> Our second speaker this morning is Neil Richards. And Neil is a professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis. And he got his bachelor's degree from George Washington University and a law degree from the law school at the University of Virginia. He is one of the leading experts in privacy law and serves on the advisory board of the Future of Privacy Forum. A fun fact about Neil, he was born in England, and he is a lifelong supporter of the Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> and our moderator, moderator today is a local from Norwich, Peter Teachout. Peter is a professor of law at the Vermont Law School, where he's taught there for over 40 years. Peter earned a BA degree from Amherst College and a master's degree from the University of Sussex and a law degree from Harvard. Early in his career while on the faculty at the University of Washington, do you notice that all three of these people had something to do with Washington in their resume? He was a visiting, visiting professor at Dartmouth Tuck School of Business, and he also has been a visiting fellow at Cambridge University and at Dartmouth. And a fun fact about Peter is that in 1967, while he was in the Army in Washington, D.C., he uh, went around to congressional offices and talked to them about <clears throat> allowing the citizens of Washington to have local elections, and they passed a law that allowed them to, to elect school boards. <laughs> Six years later, they passed the Home Rule uh, Law for Washington, D.C. Please welcome Jennifer, Neil, and Peter. Thank you, Pete. It's a great honor and privilege to be able to participate in the debate today and also to participate in this excellent series this summer on critical thinking for the preservation of democracy. Our topic for today is threat to individual privacy that is represented by the emergence of the new digital technology. <clears throat> 
It's a very, very serious issue. It is not just related to our personal lives, but also, as we will see from the discussion, related to the effective preservation of an open and democratic society. My job as moderator is to provide a little bit of background and set the stage for the debate today. And I want to begin with the language of the Fourth Amendment itself, which was ratified in 1781. It begins, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Now, in part, that reflects a deep-seated tradition in Anglo-American culture reflected in the expression, a man's home is his castle, the sense that somehow there is a sphere of private life that ought to be free from surveillance, or invasion, either by government or by others. But in part, it was reflection of a very particular experience in colonial America. I think it's helpful to understand that historical background. If we go back to the 18th century in that period, following the French and Indian War, but before the Revolution, well, they, British government had incurred very substantial expenses in the prosecution of the, what we call the French and Indian War, protecting the interests of the English colonists against the French. And they wanted, of course, the English colonists, therefore, to contribute to the payment of those expenses. And it's a familiar story for many of you, but basically they began to impose what we would call import duties on commonly uh, uh, needed goods and supplies like paper, glass, sugar, tea, uh, indigo, uh, uh, as a way of soliciting contributions from the English colonists. Well, as you might imagine, both colonial merchants and colonial consumers said, we don't want to pay those duties. And so what emerged, I don't think we need to be ashamed of it, was a system of smuggling goods into America to avoid having to pay those customs duties. Now this brings us to the English response. What they created, and it's very interesting, they authorized something called the people to um, use writs of assistance. Uh, customs officials by themselves could not enforce the anti-smuggling laws, so they wanted to solicit the assistance of the colonists themselves. Now, writs of assistance are like a search warrant, except they're also like a blank check. There was no requirement that they identify that the goods or the contraband that were being searched. There was no requirement that you identify a particular person or identify any reason for suspecting that person for engaging in contraband. They were open-ended. Anybody who obtained one of these documents, the writs of assistance from a customs official, then perhaps a neighbor with whom you were having a little bit of a quarrel. Anyone who could obtain one of these could come to your house with a writs of assistance because they were freely transferable, unlike they could not be enforced not just by law enforcement officials, but by any citizen who had one. Could come to your house, say, I've got a writ of assistance. You must let me enter your house. They could ransack your roll top desk, purportedly looking for contraband. They could come poking around in your bedroom. They could poke around your house. And they could be used for, they, they were used in ways that often were, were, were simply for reasons of personal spite and abuse. So that experience then, the use of these writs of assistance, was an immediate background for the adoption of the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Now notice, that's not just applied to law enforcement officials. 
That applied also to private citizens who had access to these writs of assistance. So I want to now fast forward to the present day and say today we're not faced with the threat of invasion, physical invasion of our homes by either law enforcement or by private actors, but we are faced with the potential of invasion of our personal lives by what's represented by the new digital technology. The new technology makes it possible for government and the private sector for companies like Amazon, Google, Yahoo, to collect enormous amounts of information about our personal and private lives. Every time you use your cell phone, every time you use the search engine, or you, search, you do a search on your smartphone or your computer, a record is being made of the search that you've undertaken. And you can step back from that and you say, when you look at the composite of all this data that has been collected about you, those who want to use that information can use it to document a complete, com pretty complete record of your personal life. They can tell you where you've been. They can tell you who your contacts are. They can tell you about the kinds of things you like and the kinds of things you don't like. They can tell people about your political sentiments, whether you're leaning conservative or progressive. They can tell whether you've been interested in maybe some taboo subjects, ideas. They can tell whether you've been maybe toying with some radical thoughts. All that information potentially is available for use by those who want to use it that way. And I'm saying not just by government, as we shall see, but also by the private sector. So what do we do about it? Well, today's debate, we're going to be looking at two aspects of the problem, these threats to our individual and family privacy resulting from the digital revolution. Our, the, the focus of our debate is what are the implications of the digital revolution for our ability for our ability to maintain a private space in our lives free from surveillance, free from data collection. Have we lost that ability completely? The new technology is a wonderful thing. It allows us a kind of efficient, convenient way of understanding the world that we never had before, but it also has this other side. So what's, what are the implications of this digital revolution for our ability to maintain a private space in our lives free from government surveillance or data collection? One way to think about it is privacy as it's traditionally been understood really dead. Is privacy still a viable idea? Uh, so as we move to, to the next step in our debate, we're going to ask the question, first of all, which is the more serious threat to our privacy represented by this new digital technology? Is it invasion, surveillance by government? Is it surveillance and data collection by the private sector, by companies like Amazon, Google, and Yahoo? Professor Daskal, who's going to lead off, will take the position that the threat of government invasion is the more serious one. And Professor Richards, who will follow, will take the position that the threat of data collection by the private sector is the more serious threat to privacy. And I suppose that leads then finally to the real question, which is if there is a serious threat to privacy, to maintaining a sphere of privacy in our lives free from surveillance and data collection, if there is a serious threat, what, if anything, can we do about it? Thank you, <laughs> Professor Daskal. So thank you. First, I just want to thank um, all of you for coming out and to the Osher Lecture Series for inviting me here. It's really an honor to be here. 
So I'm going to start by saying privacy is under threat. It's alive, but it's beating a lot slower than it used to, threatened in all kinds of different directions. Now, to be clear from the outset, I agree that we, right, that we are right to be concerned about consumer privacy, and we as a nation have done far too little to protect against the threats posed by private invasions into our privacy. But that said, the biggest threat has and always will come from the government, and our founding fathers were right to recognize this, and we need to do a lot more to update our laws vis-a-vis -vis surveillance by the government. So I'm going to make three brief arguments in my time here, which is first, why does the government pose a significant threat? Why were the founding fathers right to recognize this? The ways in which US laws, while arguably more robust than just about any other nation in the world with respect to government surveillance, are nonetheless not good enough, and a little bit about what can be done. So we all know this, but it's worth emphasizing that it's only the government that can arrest us. It's the only the government that, at least for now, can lawfully engage in premeditated, sanctioned killings. It's only the government that can subject our businesses to economic sanctions and therefore prohibit anybody from engaging in basically any economic interaction with that particular business. It's only the government that can put us on no-fly lists and tell airlines that that individual can never get on a plane or, if not put on no-fly lists, put on watch lists and then subject us to harassing secondary screening every time we want to travel. And if we look at what other governments do, the threat posed by public actors abusing their authority is even more stark. In China right now, we have an entire ethnic group being subject to re-education campaigns and constant surveillance, what some have called death by surveillance. They're tracked in everything they do. They're forced to learn Mandarin Chinese. They've been placed in re-education centers where they're reportedly subject to torture and, and abuse in what appears to be a sophisticated and potentially highly effective effort by the Chinese government to wipe out the Muslim Uyghur population in the province of Xinjiang. And in countless other places around the world, governments monitor and track dissenters and then punish them through arrest, detention, and a range of other sanctions backed by the power, the course of power of the state. Now, to be clear, I do not want to discount the threats posed by private surveillance. I, like the rest of us, find it really creepy when I click on that shoe for a second and then get repeated ads for it over and over and over again, even though I really don't like that shoe. <laughs> but much more seriously, as I'm sure Neil will highlight, the private sector does have all kinds of access to personal health, economic, and other data that can then be used to discriminate with respect to healthcare, loans, and a host of other areas with severe consequences for individuals' lives, and we ought to be concerned about that. And this information can, in turn, be shared with the government. But even as powerful as private companies are, the government has the unique authority, the unique capacity to gather a bunch of information from a bunch of different private companies and aggregate that information and tell basically the entire stories of our lives, including who we associate, where we go, and even, as Peter said earlier, our thoughts. And the risk is a massive erosion of something that Neil's written about, but that is, I think, a really important concept, which is our intellectual privacy. And that risk, the risk is that that intrusion is then backed with the course of authority of the state to detain, harass, and otherwise abuse. Now, as we've already heard, this risk was recognized at our founding. Outrage over general warrants, the writs of assistance that Peter talked about, pursuant to, as Peter said, the king would authorize anywhere, anyone, at any time to to engage in searches regardless of whether or not the individual was suspected of a crime was a huge trigger that led to the revolt and uprising against the crown in the late 1700s. 
And it was also a key motivating factor behind the Bill of Rights, which as we've already heard, protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and also importantly, requires that warrants are issued based on probable cause by an independent judge, particularly describing the place to be searched or the thing to be seized or the person to be seized. Now, as much as the rest of the world likes to beat up on the United States for its insufficient privacy protections, the reality is that these constitutional rules governing governmental access to evidence, the requirement of a warrant, the requirement of probable cause, the requirement of independent, independent judicial review, the requirement of particularity as to the thing or person to be searched or seized are amongst the most privacy protective in the world. The problem is, that a combination of rapid technological change and a narrowing via judicial and executive branch interpretations about the scope of the Fourth Amendment have sig significantly narrowed these protections over time. And we don't have a good framework in place as an alternative. So the problems are many. Um, I'm going to um, talk about three. Um, first, there is a vast amount of collection that takes place outside of the Fourth Amendment. It's not governed by the Fourth Amendment or equivalent statutory rules, and therefore not subject to the relative privacy protective requirements of a warrant, independent judge, probable cause, and particularity. Now, Edward Snowden's revelations about the scope of foreign intelligence collection were a wake-up call in this regard, revealing the vast scope of collection for intelligence purposes. But even within the domestic criminal context, there is a large amount of collection that takes place outside the strictures, outside of the limits of the Fourth Amendment. And I'll return to this in a moment. Second, there's very little in the way of either constitutional rules or statutory rules governing how collected information is used, disseminated, retained once, in fact, it is accessed by the government even in those cases where the initial collection is governed by the Fourth Amendment or other applicable statutory rules. And third, even when a Fourth Amendment violation does take place or appears to have, take place, have taken place, there is very little opportunity for individuals to challenge that unless that evidence is being used against the target of the investigation, the target of the surveillance in a criminal case and in that setting, there's all kinds of reasons why judges are hesitant to find Fourth Amendment violations because it often means that the evidence can't be used in either that or a future criminal case, and the judge may, for, for maybe good reasons, believe that the person or people before him or her um, appear to be guilty of the crime for which they're charged. Now, there's a lot, there's a ton to talk about here. For now, I'm going to focus on... Um, two key issues um, with respect to some of these problems. First, some of the substantive limits on the protections provided by the Fourth Amendment, and second, on the geographical limits of the Fourth Amendment um, and the concrete effects of both on surveillance. Now, on the first issue, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, I spend weeks and weeks and weeks on what this means in my criminal procedure class, so I'm gonna to try to do it in about three minutes here. Um, <laughs> but the key issue, the key takeaway, is that if it's not a search or seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes, then there's no Fourth Amendment protections. And the definition of what is a search or seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes often has very little correlation with what ordinary people think the definition of search or seizure means. Either there has to be a trespass into a protected space, like a home, or there has to be a violation of what is known as a reasonable expectation of privacy. This is a doctrine that arose out of a 1960s case involving the police listening into somebody's um, telephone calls that were made from a phone booth. And the definition of a reasonable expectation of privacy turns a lot on what judges think are reasonable expectation of privacy. And for a long time, this definition of what is a reasonable expectation of privacy has been coupled with another doctrine known as the third party doctrine, 
which basically says when that an individual shares something with a third party, that individual loses his or her reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. Now, if we think about the digital age, we think about how much information we are constantly sharing with third parties, all the companies that manage our phone, that manage our apps, that control the Internet of Things, if anybody has interconnected devices in their homes. Um, so we, if, if that doctrine holds, we basically have no privacy in anything. Now, there's good news there, which I'll return to in a second, but just um, to kind of provide a scope of the examples of the ways in which our ordinary sense of search and seizure doesn't necessarily map onto the Fourth Amendment definition of search and seizure. I'll provide a few examples. So there's no, according to the court, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in our trash bags, even if, in their, if, even if they're in opaque bags tied up that are left upon the street for pickup by the garbage collector because it's possible that the nosy neighbor might look through that garbage and therefore law enforcement can go through our trash without a warrant and without triggering the Fourth Amendment. There's no reasonable expectation of what we do in our backyard if what we do in our backyard is visible by a helicopter flying overhead, even if that helicopter was leased by the police for the purposes of monitoring what we are doing in our backyard. The same goes for drone surveillance, potentially. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy in our electronic bank records, so there's no search under the Fourth Amendment if the government demands records of our transactions from our banks. There's no reasonable expectation of what we do in public, so there's no search if law enforcement or other government officials engage in video surveillance of any of us walking down the street. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy in phone numbers dialed or received, or arguably the two from lines on our emails, so there's no search when the government, for Fourth Amendment purposes, when the government's collecting that information. And in fact, it was exactly this doctrine that the United States government relied on in support of what many of you um, may very well be familiar with. It's called the Telephony Metadata Program, pursuant to which the US government, this was part of the Snowden revelations, engaged in the warrantless collection of the phone numbers dialed and received of almost all Americans, thereby able to piece together associations of particular suspects. Now that said, as I said, there was some good news. Um, the court has started to recognize some of these limitations, and just last summer, in a landmark decision called Carpenter versus the United States, the, government, the Supreme Court rejected the government's argument that law enforcement did not need a warrant to collect months worth of historical cell site location information because it had been provided with a share with a third party. Now historical cell site location information is the, the data that it's basically a mapping of where somebody is making phone calls from. It, it shows the pinging of the cell phone to the cell phone towers and it can be used to basically map somebody's location historically over time. And the court said that even though this data had been shared with a third party, namely the phone company, um, it was still protected under the Fourth Amendment, therefore pushing back on that doctrine I mentioned earlier, the third party doctrine. And the court focused on the deeply revealing nature of this data, its breadth, its depth, its comprehensive reach, and the inescapable and automatic nature of collection. Now that said, the court was also very careful to say that it was a narrow holding limited to the particular technology and the particular facts of this case. Um, that said, um, I think it's fair to say that anybody reading this opinion and reading the arguments of the opinion will be, will, can, can reasonably think that over time, um, the Supreme Court and other courts will, relying on these factors, also conclude that a range of other digital information that's shared with third parties is also protected by the Fourth Amendment and therefore subject to the warrant requirements. But before we get too excited about this, I think it's important to note that the court only rarely weighs in and does so um, 
after long lapses of time during which there's the potential for very significant technical innovation and technical change, therefore leading huge gaps in potential coverage. So the search at issue in the Carpenter versus United States case took place in 2011, and it wasn't until 2018 that the Supreme Court issued its decision. And I think we can only imagine how much technical change and how much innovation will happen in the next seven years if we think back where we were just seven years ago. And unfortunately, our statutes are also, our relative statutes are also woefully out of date. So the key statute, at least governing law enforcement access to digital information, is something called the Electronic Communication Privacy Act. This was enacted in 1984. This is before I ever touched a computer. It was before the World Wide Web. It was before cloud computing. And this statute's also outmoded in key, really important ways and fails to address a whole range of technolog technologies like facial recognition, use of biometrics, and browsing history, just to name a few. And this really needs to be updated. Now quickly, um, I will also talk about um, another key problem with respect to Fourth Amendment protections, and that's the geographic reach of the Fourth Amendment. So in a 1990 case from the Supreme Court, a case called Verdiga Urquidez versus the United States, the Supreme Court basically held or confirmed an opinion that many had long held that the Fourth Amendment is territorially limited. And what that means is that while the Fourth Amendment is widely understood to protect Americans and any other person who's physically present within the United States, the Fourth Amendment does not impose any limitations on US government action if it's acting outside the United States against foreigners. And this is important because this doctrine is relied on heavily in support of the nation's foreign intelligence surveillance schemes. It's a key justification for the warrantless collection of the data of foreigners located outside of the United States on the grounds in part that they're not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Now the problem is that we all know this, communications are intermingled. Many of us have foreign friends. Many of us have foreigners who are part of our families. Many of us have foreigners with whom we engage in business. We might communicate with them. And even if we don't personally communicate with foreigners, we may engage in a communication that then gets forwarded to somebody else's foreign friend or business partner or family member. So even if we accept the premise that the Fourth Amendment ought to only cover Americans and those within the United States, the reality is that there is a vast quantity of communications about Americans and about others in the United States that are then collected vis-a-vis -vis the warrantless surveillance of foreigners outside the United States. This is what's known as incidental collection, um, and it en engages, and the intelligence community knows this, it results in the relatively large-scale collection, warrantless collection of communications of Americans and other people in the United States. Now to address this, the intelligence community has adopted a number of rules and restrictions on retention, dissemination, and access of this data. But for the most part, these rules and standards are left to the executive branch to both develop and implement. Um, the executive branch subjects itself to its own executive branch oversight. There is some congressional oversight. But as we talked about earlier, this is a far cry from the kind of independent judicial oversight um, that is called for in the Fourth Amendment. And um, again, as I said, I would mention some areas where I think change is needed. This is another area where change is needed. There ought to be clearer statutory rules and requirements with respect to, among other things, the retention, dissemination, and access of this information. Um, finally, I will just briefly note one other risk that is posed by government collection of information, 
as the government aggregates data from a lot of different sources and collects all of this data, it obviously has, or at least has the potential to have, very large um, data sources in the hands of the government. And with everything, that data is not always necessarily 100% secure, and there is also a risk of breach, and the risk of that data in turn getting in the hands of nefarious actors or people we ought to be concerned about. So, in sum, the Founding Fathers were right to recognize the particular threat posed by government surveillance. The Supreme Court's opinion in Carpenter reflects that we can adopt, the court can adopt, the Constitution can adopt, but the court moves slowly, way more slowly than technological innovation. And if we rely solely on the court for privacy protections vis-a-vis -vis government collection, we will soon have little to no privacy left. And so as we start as a nation talking about the need for a national privacy law, which has been an increased topic of conversation, we need to make sure that as has happened in other places, we don't shift all of our focus to consumer privacy and leave out government surveillance as well because those laws are also desperately in need of updating. We don't want to do what Europe did. Europe has a very robust data protection regime, but it exempts law enforcement and it exempts the intelligence community from any of those rules, thereby effectively creating an exception that swallows the rule. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the, uh, the organizers for inviting me, and, and thank you to, to Jen for such a fascinating presentation. Um, I agree with everything that she says, except for the part where she says that uh, the government is the greater threat. So I want to talk about uh, private threats to, to privacy, and, and I want to make basically a simple claim today. Um, as we have agreed, I think as we can all agree perhaps, um, there can be no debate that privacy is under threat in our digital age. And we understand for, for many of the reasons that, that Jen gave, and, and given the limits of time for many other reasons that she could have given, that the state can and does threaten privacy and that we need to do a better job dealing with that. But I wanna suggest that private threats to our privacy are more dangerous and that's in part because they are more insidious. They are harder to track, they are harder to understand. We lack the conceptual, legal, historical, cultural frameworks for dealing with private power in general and private threats to privacy in particular. I wanna make four basic points today in the 15 to 20 minutes I'm gonna to speak to you. First, I wanna point out and explain how private threats to our privacy are everywhere. They are in this room. Second, I want to suggest and explain how those private threats are harmful. I want to third pick up the point that I just made, that we lack the vocabulary to talk about private power and private threats to privacy in particular. And fourth, show how private actors make government threats to privacy worse and how they enable many of the most dangerous, many of the most menacing, many of the most innovative government threats to our privacy. Let me have a quick note about privacy and what we mean by privacy before we go on. Um, when I say privacy, I, I do mean surveillance, observation, uh, collection of information about us, uh, but I also want to talk about the rules governing that information because the conversation about privacy in a digital age is often about creepiness. It's often about how creepy uh, forms, that, that is actually quite creepy, um, forms of observation, forms of surveillance are, and less so about what we do about it, about what the rules, the norms, the regulations, the expectations governing the information collection about us that is happening uh, 
on all of us right now as we sit in this recorded room uh, with smartphones in our pockets. I want to suggest in particular that conversations about privacy in the digital age are fundamentally conversations about power. Government power, corporate power, individual power. And I want to suggest that privacy should not be seen as an end in itself, but as a means to other things we care about. Privacy rules should be seen as a means to other things we care about. And this is my next book um, uh, where I'm going to argue that four such good things are developing our identities. This is, is more about intellectual privacy, political freedom against the state, consumer protection as consumers, and trust as members in a, of a digital society that we can rely upon society to be predictable, to be just, and to be fair. Okay, so back to my, my main argument, private threats are everywhere. How many of you have a smartphone in your pockets or your purse right now? I was a, I was a little nervous since this, this is a slightly older crowd than the, <laughs> the median of the American population um, that I might get two hands, but good. Uh, I, I got this, roughly the same response as I would get as if I were teaching a, a class of 400 of my, of my students at Washington University. Um, how many cameras? Are in the, I mean, there's the big one, uh, hello Georgia and Lexington and all the other places that are tuning in, hello Concord, uh, and I missed one, I feel terrible, so the places I didn't mention, hello to you as well. Um, the cameras that are in the room right now, but of course our smartphones have cameras on them too. Um, they have cameras in the back, and they have also have cameras in the front. Uh, so let's say there are 400 people in the room right now conservatively. That means there are 800 high-definition audio vis video, video cameras capable of taking still images and video front and back simultaneously. Right? That, that's a lot. Uh, eight, 800 cameras, 400 microphones. Um, does anybody have one of these? Right, this is, my, my, my son and I went to Chicago last week uh, to see a couple of Cubs games. Uh, and there was one of these sitting in our hotel room. This is an Amazon Alexa. It is a voice-activated smart home assistant. Um, we had one before my wife made me turn it off. Um, <laughs> it is a microphone that is always on in your living room. And you can talk to Alexa and ask her the weather. And, um, but it's always recording. And, and, and Amazon would really like to, of course, our smartphones have this capability as well, right? Uh, hey Siri, show me pictures of cute dogs, right? Some of your phones may have already activated now um, because both Google and, and Apple phones have voice activation. Um, but these are hardwired appliances that happen to, to be in our homes. Amazon, th this, is, this is not my Amazon and this is not my wife. Um, <laughs> but, this is an actual Amazon advertising image. They want you to have Alexa in your bedroom recording everything that goes on um, to you, it, just in case you need to know uh, what the movie times are to see, uh, to, to see a film um, or to use it as an alarm clock. Um, how many of you, I'm gonna ask a question. I, I'm assuming you all have televisions. Um, can you buy a television without a remote control these days? No. Um, Increasingly, you will not be able to buy a television with a remote control because televisions will start being built in with voice-activated uh, navigation, which is, as a, at a technological level, is fantastic, right? We, we are not designed, uh, we, we, we did not evolve to use digital devices or even to be able to read. We evolved to communicate doing exactly what I'm doing to you right now, which is talking and listening. It's going to be technologically quite useful, but increasingly, ubiquitously, devices in our lives, our, our phones, our alarm clocks, our televisions, our cars, are going to have always on, always listening uh, microphones put in place by, by private actors. As we push forward the frontiers of medicine, we are increasingly going to have all of our genomes sequenced, the, the, the digital code locked in the nuclei of our cells that tells our bodies what to do, uh, also sequenced by, by private actors. You, we will go to the doctor increasingly, and we will get personalized medicine designed uh, around our genomic code, but that also means ever more invasive, ever more intimate, ever more sensitive data about us uh, is going to be recorded uh, just as part of ordinary modern living, waking up, 
watching TV, driving our cars, communicating, and going to the doctor's office. And there are problems. Um, I suspect there's 400 people here. About 200 of you were victims of the Equifax data breach. Uh, it, it's hard to change your social security number. It, it's, it's much harder to change your genomic code. Um, <laughs> Often, uh, digital uh, surveillance by private actors leads to uh, blackmail. Uh, this is a, I, this, I didn't get this, but this is a uh, typical blackmail scheme where they, they obtain control of your computer uh, based upon getting your passwords or other information um, and then demand money in exchange for getting your files back. Um, among many of our, of our younger members of society, right, if you've ever seen a bunch of teenagers together, um, they all sit at, at, the, at the diner table. I can't stray too far from the microphone. Um, and they all stare into their phones, uh, communicating with each other. Um, young people have smartphones everywhere. Um, young people do dumb things. We were all young people once. We all did dumb things. Um, they increasingly do dumb things with their smartphones and with their ubiquitous cameras. Um, there are millions, if not billions, of, of intimate images of people, predominantly women, um, we have the problem of, of non-consensual pornography, co colloquially known as revenge porn, um, which has led to blackmail, to emotional trauma, um, to career devastation, and in many cases to suicide on the part of, of young people, all from ubiquitous collection and sharing and, and wanton disclosure. And then, and then we have a, a topic we can't even begin to scratch the surface of this morning, which is artificial intelligence, which is uh, increasingly using personal data to fuel decisions about us uh, by, by corporations. Okay, so private threats are everywhere. Uh, private threats are also harmful. Um, we have narratives for government surveillance and government, uh, this, is, this is me at the airport yesterday. Um, <laughs> we have mental images for government surveillance and, and, and why that is bad and what we can do about it, right? We, this is troubling. Um, we don't have the same uh, understanding of the threats that can come from uh, scoring of, our, of ourselves, uh, whether computer credit, computer credit scoring, employment availability scoring, uh, an argument that is highly salient to my students, uh, the scoring of applicants for admission at elite colleges and universities like the one we are in right now. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for, for redlining and for discrimination on the basis of algorithmic scoring, on the, on the basis of, well, you only have a 47 on the scale and somebody else has a 90. Uh, and, and often those scores can reflect uh, racial biases or gender biases or class biases, um, and they can be highly insidious. The, the ads that the Jen was talking about for shoes, um, I don't get a lot of women's shoe ads. Um, I, do, I, have, I have started getting ads for uh, lipstick for mature women. Um, this is literally true, um, uh, which, which may reveal something about me that you don't know, or it may reveal something about me that I don't know. Um, the, the digital economy, though, and this is a very serious point, runs upon ubiquitous surveillance of everything you read and everywhere you go in order to sell you things like, like shoes or mature women's lipstick. Um, it seems like a great product. Um, it can be used to discriminate by only certain people getting certain commercial opportunities. Less worrisome when it comes to ad serving, more worrisome when it comes perhaps to price discrimination on services like Amazon, which has the capability to do that and may even be engaging in it. Today when people apply for jobs, they don't send resumes to companies, they, they post resumes on websites like this one, ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter has a proprietary algorithm uh, that it uses to score job applicants, and there's considerable evidence that there's a lot of discrimination going on uh, and denial of employment opportunity to people on the basis of digital factors they don't even know exist, much less that they can, they can deal with. Private companies also shape the way we learn about the world. So a few years ago, uh, uh, the Harvard Law professor, Cass Sunsky, wrote a book called Republic.com. Um, he argues that, and worried, and this is in, in the late 90s, we were approaching a world where everything was cultivated to what Nicholas Negroponte called the daily me. 
You, you pull up your own digital newspaper and you only get stories about things that you like, uh, w whether that is the president or whether that is not the president. Um, he worried that you would live in a, in a bubble, uh, an echo chamber in which personalized news feeds would shape the way you, we experience and understand the world with ruinous consequences for our democracy. Facebook uses, uses the newsfeed. This is, this is my newsfeed. Those are, those are my children. Um, they're, they're older and surlier now that they're teenagers, but they're still, <laughs> they're still cute. Hi, hi Fiona. Um, the, the fear is that, this is Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. The, the fear is that these companies are acting as, as, as puppeteers, that, that they are influencing the news that we access, uh, and, and we're not getting a, 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 the kind of picture of the world that a, that a liberal arts education of the sort that is, that is advanced by institutions like the one that is hosting us today um, uh, have, have done so well to, to teach generations of, of students. Increasingly, private entities affect the way that we vote. And this is the Cambridge Analytica scandal where a, an English company used Facebook data. Um, basically, what they would do is, let's say you're all my Facebook friends, uh, uh, and some people have 400 friends. They'd pay me $5. I would give them access to my feed, which is all of your shared data, and they would use that at, at a ratio of about 1 to 400 to, con to collect highly detailed psychological profiles of all of you and then serve you ads that influence the way you vote, or if they don't like the way you're going to vote, that keep you from voting so that the other candidate can win. There's evidence, uh, that there's undeniable evidence that the Cambridge Analytica scandal certainly was, was pushing the guy in the middle um, uh, as, as the, the presidential candidate was favoring him. Um, we don't know whether it influenced the election or not. There are conflicting accounts on that. We do know, however, that in my other country, um, Cambridge Analytica's uh, use of Facebook data did affect the Brexit referendum. Um, and, and, and is, is partially to blame um, for the carnage that is going on in the European political system right now. Finally, private actors have undermined the advertising model which supports a free press. Have you noticed that newspapers are closing? It's not because of digital formats, right? Putting a newspaper on the web actually is cheaper. They don't have to print, they don't have to buy paper and ink, um, and they can reach more people. The problem is that the Facebooks and Googles of the world have stolen the advertising revenue because, they, because of their superior surveillance-based model. Advertisers are willing to pay more for targeted ads, and that, that, if more than anything else, has caused the crisis in the economic model of journalism, which has caused the crisis in the profession of, of journalism, which I think is also contributing to the crisis of our digital democracy. Okay, third point. We lack the vocabulary, though, to talk about threats to, uh, caused by private power, whether in privacy or otherwise. We have a rich tradition of talking and thinking about the threats of unchecked government power, some of which Jen eloquently relied upon. Right? We have George Orwell's 1984. We have its, its metaphor of Big Brother. And we have tools to deal with government power. They're not perfect tools but they are resonant. I just can show you images of some of these tools. We understand the Constitution checks government power. The Bill of Rights checks government power. We can go further back to Magna Carta 804 years ago. Uh, government power being understood as dangerous checks for that power. We lack the equivalent ways of talking about private power. When I was in college, uh, there was a, uh, a scandal in 1995. I, I just made myself sound really young, but I, but I feel very old. Um, Walmart pulled this t-shirt from the shelves. It was a, a Dennis the Menace character saying, someday a woman will be president. Walmart thought it offended family values. They took it down. You may remember this scandal. Um, it was in the news for a few days. Everyone said, there was a censor. Walmart said, no, no, we're a private corporation. We can't censor. Um, but, if, but if Facebook takes the news away, it might not be censorship in the traditional sense, um, but we don't have a, have a, a, a conceptual framework. We, we lack the intuitions. We lack the cultural touchstones like Big Brother to deal with, with situations like this when, when corporate actors work. 
In addition, constitutional rules like the Fourth Amendment, even though the writs of assistance did apply to private actors, do not apply to corporations. And at the same time, the new Supreme Court justices are increasingly finding that corporations have constitutional rights. Do, do you guys have Hobby Lobby in, in New England? Did you know that Hobby Lobby has a religion which is recognized by the Supreme Court um, of evangelical Christianity, which allows it to deny uh, uh, health reproductive health benefits to its employees, right? That's, that's the Hobby Lobby case. Um, corporations have free speech rights, they ha now have religions, but we don't have the same legal and conceptual and cultural set of intuitions and concepts and tools to deal with our checks on power. Final point, um, private actors make government threats worse. In 2000, right before 9-11, before, before Snowden, before Facebook, Widespread surveillance of everything we do, everywhere we go, everything we read and think was technically infeasible. It was impossible as a technological matter, and it was politically impossible. But corporate innovation, as they like to call it, has solved each of these problems. First, by creating the technologies, right? Silicon Valley um, has developed tools that, that have conditioned us to, to surveillance being just the price we pay for living in the modern world. Um, there's vast marketing of surveillance technology by private companies to, uh, to law enforcement. It's worth noting that Edward Snowden, when he did, had his re revelations, wasn't working for the NSA anymore. He was working for Booz Allen Hamilton, which, was a defense, which is a defense contractor. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and Cambridge Analytica uh, are conditioning us uh, and creating these tools that enable surveillance and influence and exertions of power in part by also shifting social norms. Our expectations of privacy are malleable. Uh, a Google CEO uh, once was candid and said that our policy is to get right up to the creepy line and not cross it. Um, and to constantly move, and, and not just move at us, but move across the generations, what is expected as private and what is not. And finally, corporations are doing some of the dirty work, right? Snowden is uh, and was a, a defense contractor. Uh, there are lots of, of private companies, uh, drone companies and, and AI companies, companies like Palantir, that are doing the algorithmic work for things like family separation at the border in a contractor basis in ways that the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution perhaps don't apply to them, or certainly not as much. Let me end and conclude with a note of hope. <laughs> This is where I grew up. Um, seriously, I, I grew up in the north of England, which was the first place in the world to endure the Industrial Revolution with problems of pollution, workplace safety, discrimination. Um, solving the problems of the Industrial Revolution has taken over a century. We are still, with issues like climate change, still grappling with the problems of the Industrial Revolution, but we managed it, even though it required us to revisit some of our settled assumptions about what the threats to individual liberty were and what a good society looks like. Um, similarly, we've been able to, to process the, the car. Um, even though cars are very dangerous, uh, my eldest child has just got a driver's license, so stay off the roads. Um, <laughs> hi, Fiona. Um, the <laughs> she, she's in the audience, too, so seriously, stay off the roads. Um, <laughs> It's taken a long time to deal with the problems caused by the car, but we have a good handle on them. Um, corporations can be part of the solution, as Apple was in its resistance against uh, the FBI, right? I think the solution involves harnessing corporations against the state and harnessing the state against corporations. And, and as I argued in, in, my, in my book, Intellectual Privacy, which Jim was kind enough to mention, um, the big picture here is this. We're not seeing the death of privacy. We're not seeing the needless fussing about an irrelevant concept. What we're seeing is the continuation of a global conversation about how to manage our information as technology marches on. And this is a good thing. As we build a digital tomorrow, the choices that we make today about the boundaries between our individual and social selves, uh, between consumers and companies, between citizens and the state matter. They will have important consequences for the societies our children and grandchildren inherit, which is why I'm so delighted so many of you have come uh, to hear us talk and to participate with us in trying to work out solutions to the important issues that we're discussing this morning. Thank you.
We have about 10 or 15 minutes before we break to ask, for me to ask, the two panelists questions. First of all, I'd like to say you both did a tremendous job, each exploring the threats to privacy. <laughs> When I was listening to you, it seemed to me you both agree that the threats to individual privacy represented by the emergence of the new digital technological capacity are very serious. It seems to me you also seem to say that really we've entered a world in which there's no safe harbor, no refuge from ubiquitous surveillance and data collection about our personal and family lives. With respect to the private sector, no real vocabulary, effective vocabulary for even talking about the problem. With respect to government, serious limitations on the way the Fourth Amendment has been interpreted and applied to provide protection against government surveillance and data collection. So, so one of the first questions I have is, so, so that is bad for us. Privacy in terms of individual privacy is threatened. There's no place we can go, no, no private space anymore that we can go to where we are free from surveillance or data collection by government or by the private sector. So what does that have to do with the overall theme of this series, which is the preservation of democracy? I know you touched upon it, but, but what's the relationship between individual protecting individual privacy and the preservation of a vital uh, democracy? So I'll start off the same question for both of you. I'll start off with you, Neil. What's, what, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on the linkage there? Sure. Um, well, I, I would say if, it, Intellectual privacy is available uh, uh, for sale at one of those evil corporations that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in a fuller version of this, please buy my book. Um, that's the last ad, uh, and it wasn't a targeted one. I, I, I think the answer, though, is that, that, that I want to give two quick answers. One is, is the idea of intellectual privacy. This is the idea that in a free society, we should be free to make up our minds for ourselves who we are, what we believe, and what the nature of the world and what a good society looks like. Right? Foundational, uh, until recently, uncontroversial notions of intellectual freedom. To protect intellectual freedom, which is at the core of a democracy, we need to have intellectual privacy, protection from surveillance, protection from interference, when we're engaging in that process of making sense of the world, whether that is thinking or reading or communicating with confidants. When we are watched, there's a lot of good empirical evidence that suggests we move our behavior, we move our reading habits, we move our beliefs to the boring, the bland, and the mainstream. We all went to middle school where being ordinary was heavily privileged. Um, and, and the reason middle school is awful is because there's this tyranny of the majority. Um, and I, I worry that, that if, we, if we don't push back on constant surveillance, that's what's going to happen to our democracy. That we're not gonna be able to, to engage with, with dissident, deviant, eccentric or weird ideas. And, and don't forget, many of the ideas that we cherish so deeply as the foundations of a, of a modern, progressive, liberal democracy are ones that people quite literally have been murdered for or burned at the stake for. The, the idea that all people are equal, regardless of race or gender. Uh, the idea that uh, people should be free to believe whatever they want about God or, or, or religion, or including nothing at all. 
Um, the idea that religion should be protected by the state, but religion should not run the state. These, are, these were all once considered dissident or deviant ideas, and I think we're deluding ourselves if we think we have all the answers now, and there aren't other ideas out there that future generations will look back at us and say, wow, those people in 2019, they, they were really ignorant because they didn't understand X, whatever X happens to be. We need the freedom to engage with these ideas in order to work those things out the best way that we can. And surveillance, whether by people we know or whether by the state, really threatens and, and, and chills that. And, and second, I would say, in, in relation to democracy, one of the things that we see in countries that slide away from democracy is not autocracy overnight. We see a steady erosion of democratic norms and democratic values. We see political polarization. I'm, I'm not meaning to describe our society, but if the parallels strike you, feel free to, to, uh, to, to, to make them for yourself. But what we see as the next step is, is blackmail and embarrassment and discrediting of political opponents based upon things from their, their personal lives, based upon things that are irrelevant, perhaps, to the reason they are disliked, but are politically convenient ways of, of neutralizing them, or embarrassing them, or turning them, or blackmailing them. And, and, that, and that's a, a particular threat to democracy that comes from uh, the availability of widespread surveillance and, and widespread, intimate, sensitive, um, embarrassing uh, information about individuals. Thank you, Neil. Jen, could you respond to the same question? Sure. So I, I, mean, I, I fully agree with everything that Neil just said. I think that intellectual privacy is critically, a critically important foundation of privacy. I'll just add a couple of things. One, um, I mean, despite having described a really concerning set of issues and, then in, and calling for us as a nation to take all of this seriously, both government surveillance and also private surveillance, I wouldn't go quite as far um, as Peter did and say that privacy is dead. I mean, there, there are places where privacy exists and there are solutions. There's both some of the regulatory and statutory solutions that we talked about. There's also technological solutions. Um, Neil ended at that very end of his presentation. He had that slide of Apple versus the FBI and that was a debate about encryption and about whether or not um, the FBI could demand that um, Apple um, basically access a phone and turn over the contents of a communication. Now, um, the reality is, is that through a set of technological means, we do create spaces where things are more private. So encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, there's a whole set of technologies and future technological change that can push on that side as well. Um, Two other quick points. One, I, as we talk about that, it also raises a host of other really complicated and interesting issues. Privacy is a critically important value, but it's not an, we don't have an absolute right to privacy. And as we talk about pushing on privacy, we also have to, particularly when we think about we're, we're sitting here in just days, weeks, a little bit of time after some really horrific shootings in our country. Um, and so there's a tension between keeping things private and also ensuring that law enforcement has access to the kind of information that keeps us all safe. And so we need to, I think, constantly, as we talk about government surveillance and the risks of government surveillance, recognize that there are legitimate bases for the government to access that information. And that was the balance that, to some extent, the Fourth Amendment was trying to get right. The problem is that there's so much that's just outside of the scope of the Fourth Amendment altogether that the balance has gotten off. But I, I want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we should be creating zones of privacy where there's never any possibility of access, because I think that doesn't help any of us. And then finally, to the extent we're talking about surveillance, I think we also, to the extent we're talking about intellectual privacy, um, there is a huge risk of the kinds of surveillance technologies, um, both by the private sector and surveillance by the government that we have to be aware of. But there's another really important risk, and that is the push that we're seeing right now all around the world and increasingly in the United States as well to demand that private companies take down and keep off content on their sites 
that's unwanted, either because it spreads an unpopular ideology, either because it's defined as somehow associating with something that's unpopular. Some of it's quite legitimate and some of it needs to be taken down and there's a real risk there that I think that we start intruding into, into all of our intellectual um, privacy and the ability to have a robust and meaningful communications with one another and develop um, dissenting and unpopular ideas and we need to, I think, be really careful about that as well. Thank you, thank you, Jen. I'm gonna, you know, one of the pleasures of being mo moderator, I get to push, push the panelists just a little bit. Uh, and Jen's comments provoked uh, a, a question that I have for Neil. Uh, in, in your comments just now, and also in your book, which I did buy, and I will give a little plug for if you give me a commission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is called Intellectual Privacy. It is a great book. I recommend it to everybody in this audience if you get a chance, yeah. okay. So, so Neil, as I understand it, you say the connection between protecting privacy and the preservation of democracy is that for democracy to function and be vital, we need to create and establish spheres of privacy where people can think freely, they can read freely, they can talk with others, associates and friends freely, without any fear of government surveillance or data, or, or private surveillance or data collection. Uh, uh, even the mere suspicion that what we are thinking or reading or talking with others about may inhibit our willingness to engage in bold and sometimes controversial thinking and discussion. You put it this way in your book. You said, and you're quoting from Justice Brandeis, whom you admire in this respect. You say, Brandeis believed that self-government requires not just free speech, but freedom to communicate and explore even dangerous or subversive ideas in private. The entire experiment of self-government requires the right to be let alone by government when citizens think and examine ideas privately for themselves. Do you really mean that? How do you square that with what Jen was saying about, well, there are legitimate needs for government to do surveillance when people are discussing dangerous and subversive ideas as witnessed by the kinds of websites that existed and may have led to recent mass shootings, for example, in El Paso, okay? You want spheres of privacy for the expression, discussion of dangerous ideas, or just when there are dangerous ideas and not the dangerous ideas of others? Do you want a short answer or a, short or answer. a comprehensive short. one? You've so so I, I would say, that, that's a, it's a really great point. I, I, th I would say, I would qualify the question in a couple of respects. One is, we're talking about privacy, which is our topic today, but but your question also gets into issues of free expression, and it also gets into issues of, of criminal intent. Um, I, I would say this. In a free society, no idea is too dangerous to be taken away from a free people, at least for the purpose of their consideration, right? That is the, that's the foundation of self-government. Yes, there are really dangerous ideas, but you know what is more dangerous? Giving the government, and, and, and imagine, because as we must, I, when I teach constitutional law, I tell my students this, imagine, who, whatever your politics are, imagine that someone you don't like is the president. Give them the power to determine, and this, this happened right in the early modern period, it, it ha people were burned at the stake, um, p particularly sassy teenagers, um, as, as witches. Um, give it, giving the government the power to determine true and false, to determine what is dangerous as an idea and what is safe, is antithetical to the political freedom that your ancestors fought a revolution against my ancestors to, pr to preserve. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't legitimate needs of, of law enforcement, but policing ideas for their own sake, I think can, can rightly be taken off the table as a legitimate concern of law enforcement. Yes, there are groups, there are, there are people who, who, are, who the government has a legitimate interest in, in, in surveilling, um, but 
I, I think when we're talking about issues of violence, I, I think it's all too easy to blame, as one politician did this week, violent video games, expression for violence, without t thinking seriously about, about firearms regulation. The, the difficult thing here is this, and I want to make this coherent. These, the, a good society is going to be concerned about multiple values, and sometimes those values are going to conflict, and sometimes there are going to be difficult trade-offs among and between those values. But, but I would say two things. First, a free society demands absolute or near absolute protection for the examination of ideas. And second, when we're investigating crime, when we're, we're investigating potential terrorism, we need to balance political freedom weightily in the calculus against law enforcement less through well-meaning intentions to keep us safe, we, we embark upon the slippery slope to a police state. Thank you both. I see it's, uh, it's after 10.15, so we're gonna take a half hour break. I want, you've got little white cards. I want you to urge you to use this as an opportunity to fill out the cards and ask some questions of our panelists. I think it's really important that you do so. Thank you. Welcome back to our session on threats to individual privacy by, represented by the new digital technology and related threats. Uh, we received a large number of questions over the break for which we are very much appreciative. We'll only have a chance to get to some of them, unfortunately, before the end of the session, but we're going to begin with a question that I was asked over the break, which is looking at the language of the Fourth Amendment, which is on the screen behind me, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated there's nothing in there that says the searches and seizures can only, only refer to searches and seizures by the government. Why doesn't that apply as well to the private sector? And a related question is why shouldn't it also apply to invasions of our privacy by the private sector? Jen, I'll start with you. Sure, thanks. Um, so the. The reason is, is the entire Bill of Rights um, is a constraint against governmental action. So it's a right vis-a-vis -vis the government. That's what the Bill of Rights is about. Um, and so it's imposing limitations on the government and it's providing rights to individuals vis-a-vis -vis the government. Private sector actors can at time be acting as agents of the government in which case they are also bound by the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. But long-standing understanding is that um, private actors that are acting independently are not bound by the requirements of the Constitution in, that, in those regards, um, and certainly not bound by the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. Now that said, there is nothing that precludes Congress from imposing a range of additional requirements on private actors. Um, and, and that's an area that I think um, we all are talking about and thinking about as a nation when we start talking about the need for national privacy legislation, which is a positive thing. One other thing that I would just say, um, somebody, a couple people asked me about this in the break. Neil and I are in the position of taking two different sides in an attempt to, to make this a debate and make this lively and interesting for everybody. Um, but the reality is, is that private surveillance and governmental surveillance are highly intertwined. Um, Neil did mention this, that governmental surveillance depends in a large part 
on accessing information that has been collected by private actors. And private actors both can choose to facilitate that surveillance and they can also choose to resist. And so there's an incredible interplay between the two. So I'm going to follow that comment up, Neil, with a, with a question to which you may have the answer. How, how prevalent are collusions between private companies like Google and Facebook and the government uh, in which private companies share data collected with the government? Sure, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the, the quick answer is we don't know, um, but, but we think it's quite a lot. Uh, one of, uh, if you remember uh, back in the summer, what was it, uh, 2015 when Snowden's revelations came? 2014? Maybe it was more than that now. Um, w there was a serious sort of a drip feed of, re of revelations over the course of the summer starting in early June. Uh, one of them uh, dealt with uh, relationships between the government, between the NSA and its, and its private contractors, uh, and major, technological com major technology companies uh, to share information. Um, there are also a whole host of legal mechanisms that the government can use to get information from, uh, from, from companies. Uh, so the, the, the answer is it, it, it's complicated. Um, there are some constraints upon the companies from colluding, uh, particularly technology companies. They uh, uh, are bound by European law. Uh, which is much more protective of individual privacy in some respects than, than American law is. Uh, they're also bound by market pressures, that if it were released that uh, Facebook or, or, or Google or, uh, or Apple or Microsoft uh, had been engaged in widespread collusion, uh, that would affect their, their market value and people would stop, stop using um, the, the services. I, I think one of the the really positive developments and one of the notes of hope is many companies, uh, many tech companies have started to some extent to compete on privacy. This, I think Apple's uh, stand against the FBI was intended precisely to have that effect, uh, to, to reassure not its, its customers who are planning mass shootings, um, but the, the vast percentage of Apple customers who are not, uh, including many people in this room, I hope, um, who who, uh, who use Apple products uh, that, that they would they would protect the uh, the data of a, of the accused San Bernardino shooter. Um, so of course they would protect your data um, when you have done nothing nearly so wrong as that. Um, I, I would say though that uh, tech companies have been better than telecom companies. There was a lot of evidence that. Uh, the, the tech companies were more resistant to the NSA than companies like AT&T. In fact, Congress passed an immunity for AT&T after the Snowden revelations to protect it from um, some fairly w widespread and almost certainly illegal collusion of the sort the question uh, uh, supposes. So, so it's, it's complicated, and I think the, the, it's complicated because we don't know what the companies are doing, particularly when they're served with a secret order or a national security letter, unless they choose to fight that order and they choose to, to, to make it public. So we are somewhat in the dark. So I'll just add a couple of things, which is one, I mean, I, there was, uh, Neil was right about this, there was a massive shift after the Snowden revelations in which all of a sudden companies really were competing on privacy in a way that from the government's perspective was actually quite frustrating. So the government found itself, from the government side, the government would say that they found itself themselves in a situation where it was became hard to even get information that they felt was critical for, for national security purposes. Um, I'll just, I wanna return to one statute that I mentioned in my, in my talk, which is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, because I think it provides uh, an interesting model, and I was also asked at the break by somebody about, how, what do we do about this? And the statute's interesting because one, not only does it, does it set out um, in a outmoded, but for at, at least at the time, a relatively detailed way about what kind of process the government needed to get certain kinds of information from, from um, communications providers, from, from tech companies, from social media platforms and others. Um, it also 
prohibits, it's a, there's an explicit prohibition on companies voluntarily disclosing that data to law enforcement. So there's two issues here. How much do companies just voluntarily disclose? And then secondly, what does the government need in order to access the information? And the limitations on voluntary disclosure are important if we're concerned about um, the kind of, if we, if we think we've created an interesting statutory scheme that we all think makes sense in terms of when balancing these various interests, it's appropriate for government to get access. That scheme can be completely undercut if there's a lot of voluntary sh sharing going on. So a key component of that is also those limitations on that voluntary sharing. The problem is that the statute was written in 1984, so it doesn't address a whole range of technologies that really need to be included and incorporated and added to any new update to the statute. Thank you both. Uh, a number of uh, the cards asked the question, uh, asked questions about facial recognition technology and the proliferation of facial recognition. Is it legal? Uh, doesn't the pervasive scope of facial recognition endanger our reasonable expectations of privacy? Could either of you comment on the use and misuse of facial? recognition technology. Right, so, so as, as, we talk, as I talked about before, under the prevailing concept of the Fourth Amendment, anything that's knowingly exposed to the public, we lose our reasonable expectation of privacy in that. So yes, if we're in our home and there's some sort of surveillance that somehow like, looks through our window and takes pictures of our, of our faces in our home, that would be a problem because there's an invasion into a constitutionally protected space, arguably. If, however, we're walking down the street and facial recognition technology is used to identify us, there is no problem under the Fourth Amendment because the Fourth Amendment does not protect what's been knowingly exposed um, to, to the public. Um, so, so there's not a problem under the Fourth Amendment. There are um, efforts, there are, there's two states right now, um, Illinois and Texas, that have passed limitations on the collection and use of biometric data, including um, facial recognition technologies. Um, and so there's, there's movements, there's efforts, and in fact, interestingly, um, I think this was like a year and a half ago now, Google had a new app that was really popular where you could download, um, you could upload your picture and it would tell you what your doppelganger was from famous art, you know, did you look like the Mona Lisa or did you look like somebody else famous from some famous art museum? And they, they geo-blocked it so it wasn't available in either Illinois or Texas because it would have violated the Illinois and Texan laws. So again, when we're talking about solutions, there are solutions, there's local solutions and there's national solutions and they, they, they they, they changed what technology was available to users in Illinois and Texas as a result. Neil, do you want to add to that? Sure, I, I, I agree completely. And I think the, the challenge here is that, and the last question got into this as well, um, we have a, a, a model, a constitutional model that separates government power and private power. Um, and I think what's happened as we increasingly use digital technologies to, to, to live our lives, to, 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 to learn about the world, to read, to think, to communicate, to, uh, to navigate, uh, to track our location, we're increasingly having to share often sensitive information with companies in order to, uh, to, to do that. And, and you know, the, the market realities facing most consumers are, we don't really have a choice about that, right? The, the, the forces at work, the economic forces at work are certainly beyond the control of, of individual consumers. And so increasingly, we have to rely upon things that companies do in order to meaningfully protect our, our civil liberties. And, and facial recognition is a great example of that, that there are certain things for which facial recognition technology can be quite useful. If you if you look at your phone and it takes a picture and it recognizes your face, um, that's better than remembering yet another password, um, and it's and it's quite reliable. There are some circumventions you could you can worry about. Um, the difficulty then, as Jen talked about in her presentation, is um, then the government can say, well, private companies are able to recognize people's faces. So why can't we create a vast government facial recognition database, um, particularly since in the past, the Fourth Amendment hasn't been understood as applying 
in public. And, and the reason it didn't, didn't apply in public is it didn't need to apply in public because there weren't that many police officers and they, couldn't only, they could only follow around a certain small number of people. But now that we're all carrying uh, location tracking surveillance devices voluntarily in our pockets, um, if the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to location, this ultimately is the issue in Carpenter that Jen talked about, um, they can have, for a, a country of 300 million people, they can have 300 million police officers tracking everybody's location just by filing the requisite paperwork and, and buying uh, a relatively straightforward technology solution if the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. So it, it, it's complicated. Okay. So here's a, here's a question that was submitted by a viewer participant at UVM. Since technology has changed so rapidly and perhaps become more and more invasive, how would you update the words of the Fourth Amendment <laughs> to provide adequate protection against surveillance and data collection by government or by the private sector? Why should, we, why should we have to rely on a patchwork of statutory protections when what we're really talking about is an interest of central constitutional value as reflected in the Fourth Amendment as it was originally written? So you want to change the, the language of the Fourth Amendment? You want to leave it the same and change the composition of the Supreme Court? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a great question. I don't know, I mean, you know, a, the Constitution, you know, we, we have to, you know, if you believe in a living, breathing Constitution and one that, stand, that, adopt, that adopts and lays out broad principles and has the space and scope to adapt over time, I think the language in the Fourth Amendment is pretty good. Um, and as I said before, this, the requirements, at least to when they're applicable, of a warrant based on probable cause issued by an independent judge, with particularity as, as applied to the person or thing being searched or seized um, is a, remains today um, one of, if not the most robust privacy protective standards in the world. So I think the problem, at least with res to the respect to the Fourth Amendment, is more one of interpretation and application and not the language, not the words themselves. Um, for all of the ways in which we've talked about that search, what constitutes a search for Fourth Amendment purposes has been interpreted in ways that are out of whack with the way that I think most all of us think about searches and certainly out of whack with what's needed to establish robust and meaningful privacy protections in a digital age. The other problem, of course, is that um, the Fourth Amendment, as we've already talked about, doesn't bind private actors if they're acting as independent private actors. And that's where there is clearly a, new, a, a need for um, statutory rules. And the Fourth Amendment, as we just talked about a second ago, also doesn't in any way limit private actors from voluntarily sharing information with law enforcement or other governmental officials. And so if we're concerned about information in the hands of governmental officials and what could be done with that information, we also need to think about statutory restrictions in that regard as well. Yeah, the, the Fourth Amendment, I agree, has been actually remarkably protective. Um, uh, including by the current court in the last five years. In addition to the, as, as, as Jen knows, uh, in addition to the Carpenter case she talked about, she, she uh, uh, could, would also have talked, if, if, if we had more time, right, would, would have talked about two other cases the Supreme Court's decided in the last five or so years, one of which involves the placing of a, of a location tracker, a physical location tracker on a car, the, the Jones case, and another involving the search of a smartphone uh, incident to an arrest of, of, a, of a couple of uh, drug suspects. And in both of the, the Riley case, and in both Jones and Riley and Carpenter, um, the current Supreme Court interpreted the reasonable searches and seizures language um, from the 18th century uh, to cover advanced technological devices. And I think, uh, I think we, we 
I think we would both agree, got it right each time. And I think m most observers uh, of these issues would agree, except maybe for some law enforcement folks, um, would agree that the court got it right. The, the problem is, yes, the Fourth Amendment doesn't bind private actors, but also the Fourth Amendment cannot be very specific, right? The virtue of the standard of reasonableness um, is that it is, it is uh, flexible enough to endure across the centuries but it lacks the kind of specificity that law enforcement does need in order to figure out what do I need to do as a practical matter, where do I file, to get a warrant, where do I file the paperwork, uh, how long can a warrant last for, uh, and it's statutes like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the ECPA, as we call it, um, that provide that detail. So I think that is the best, the best system, um, and this is essentially w w what Jen's saying as well. Uh, you have a, a general standard uh, that governs the, the basic contours of the law, and then you have specific statutes that give detail to the, the constitutional protection, and that can be updated as technology, update, as technology changes, and that also expand the protections against private actors. The problem is, as, as Jem pointed out very clearly in her presentation, is the ECPA was passed in the mid-1980s, and it hasn't been updated since. So I think the solution, uh, I would agree with you completely, the solution is ECPA reform, um, it's not constitutional amendment. Particularly, um, much as we as law professors would like to rewrite the Constitution, um, as a practical matter, once we open the Pandora's box of amending the text of the Bill of Rights, um, everyone's, you know, once we cross that particular line, everyone's going to want to do it. And I think that could be actually quite destructive to our, to our democracy. Well, since we have three law professors or two and a half law professors up here on the stage, <laughs> uh, are there no amendments to the Constitution that apply to both private actors and government? What about the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery and involuntary servitude? Does that just apply to the government? No, I, I didn't expect a, a, a pop quiz on... Uh... <laughs> On, on, the, on the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but, but since you asked, Peter, um, the, the, the 13th Amendment says neither, neither I think, uh, involuntary servitude nor slavery shall exist within the United States in its first sentence. And that, has, that was intended and has been uh, interpreted to be a blanket prohibition upon uh, slavery and voluntary servitude. Uh, if... if, if, if People in the audience were, were to go home and, and uh, you know, engage in those practices to, to, to possess uh, serfs or indentured servants or, or slaves, um, that would be void under, under the 13th Amendment. There are other instances in which the, the, the bills of the rights and other rights provisions of the Constitution have been read to cover, to cover private action. Um, but as a general matter, the, the, the trend in, in American constitutionalism has been to restrict constitutional rights to, uh, to, to state actors. Though, though, since we're talking about it, I, I don't necessarily think that's, that, that need be a strict guideline. In the European system, um, they, they have a doctrine called the horizontal effect. And, and basically, that, that says that the rights guaranteed in Europe are fundamental rights, whether they have a right to privacy or right to free expression or right to, to religion, um, those rights are guaranteed. And if a state fails in its duty to protect those rights for all of its citizens, the citizens whose rights are infringed can sue the state, not because the private actor has violated their right of free speech, but because the state has failed in its social obligation, its social compact to guarantee fundamental rights for all people in its society. And I think something like that um, is certainly worth considering. Uh, it's worth considering, but highly unlikely that this court would ever interpret the Fourth Amendment that way, notwithstanding the fact it does not refer to government action. It refers to unreasonable searches and seizures. Okay, a number of you asked questions that have to do with the reality that oftentimes we seem to voluntarily give away our right to object to the collection and sharing of personal data. Now, it's a general question. Much of the data collected from individuals, but certainly not all, is voluntarily offered. People are lured by digital benefits into giving up 
their right to privacy. What, if anything, can be done about that? A more specific question was involved uh, access to DNA information. And I seem to have lost the card on that one. Uh, but that uh, information about our DNA is some of the most personal and sensitive information uh, that, is, that, that there is, uh, but oftentimes we give up our rights to claim protect. What can we do about that as individuals, if anything? Uh, I mean, I'll just say that the Supreme Court dealt with this a little bit in the Carpenter case, because the gov one of the government's main arguments was that individuals voluntarily conveyed their location information when they made phone calls and contracted with a cell phone provider to make those calls. And the Supreme Court basically said it's not voluntary in any meaningful understanding of that term because we re you really can't participate in society without having a phone. I'm paraphrasing. This is not exactly what they said. But you can't participate in society without having a phone, and you can't make a call without giving up this information. So there's not a voluntary conveyance of that right. And I think that's the right approach, and it was... Um, from my perspective, quite reassuring and accurate for the for the court to recognize that. So I think there is there is some at least recognition of of that um, reality that uh, that we're voluntarily giving up information. I think the other thing um, that this raises is as we start thinking about either state based or national privacy legislation, um, there's there's a choice and a lot of. Um, legislation or thought about regulation, at least initially, was focused on this question of what is voluntary, what's involuntary, and consent. So um, the question is, did you consent to give this information? Now, the reality is, as I think all of us know, when we get a new app or a new service or our Alexa device or anything else, our new smart TV, we generally click through the various things and click yes. And I, I mean, how many of you actually read what you're clicking through? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and so that idea of consent in the society where we're, you basically, I mean, so much of what we do is now digitally interfaced. And if we, and the idea that we're consenting by simply checking a box is a really meaningless notion. And I think there's an increased recognition of that and a move um, both in terms of people starting to think about privacy legislation and, and also amongst scholarship as well to think about tech companies as having a fiduciary responsibility to all of us independent of whether or not we're voluntarily conveying information to them or whether or not we've checked that box or consented to the sharing of information or not. Could I follow that up with what form would that fiduciary responsibility take? Would it, would it operate sort of like an implied warranty of confidentiality that co are going to bind companies no matter which boxes we check? Or how would, what, would, what would be the implications of, a, of, a, of, of establishing legally by statute or by judicial doctrine a, a fiduciary duty on the part of the private sector companies that collect our information. I mean, that, that really is the million dollar question, and that depends on what standards and, and, and normative values and procedural and regulatory obligations one decides are necessary to put on companies. But the, the, key, the key distinction here is between saying that what matters, that as long as you've consented, then, then it's okay. Um, so the shift is saying that consent does not give companies carte blanche. Companies still have responsibilities, even if individuals check those boxes. Now, what those responsibilities are is where the debate and the discussion, I think, needs to focus. And there's issues about retention. There's issues about sharing. Um, there's there's inf issues about what, in fact, is even tracked and held by the company. There's all kinds of questions. Um, that, that need to be addressed, but, but it's simply shifting the focus from a consent-based regime to an obligation that's imposed on the companies irrespective of the voluntariness of the sharing or the giving of consent. So Neil, if, if, if uh, a law were to be considered that would impose such a duty, what form would it take in your view? Sure, that, that, that's a great question. I, I agree completely with Jen that the model that we have right now, the so-called notice and choice model that is dominant for your data in the commercial context, 
Um, you had noticed because there was a long privacy policy you didn't read, and by choosing to use the service, uh, including multiple stacked services you're using simultaneously on your smartphones, uh, you agree to everything in the fine print and buyer beware, right? That, that's nonsense. Um, and, and, and privacy scholars and privacy advocates have been calling this nonsense correctly for over 20 years, and Congress has done nothing. Um, Europe has done something recently. They have this thing called the, the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which provides a long set of procedural rules. Um, I'm not sure necessarily that's, that's the right approach in the United States. I think it helps, but it's not sufficient. What I think we should move towards um, is uh, a, a notion of consumer protection for the information age that is analogous to the notion of consumer protection we developed for, for the industrial age. For example, in the industrial age, uh, all of a sudden, we, didn't, we were using products we hadn't made ourselves on our farms. Uh, you know, we didn't know how to fix an ax. We didn't know how to fix a car. We didn't know how to fix our, our, our Apple Macintosh computers. We didn't know how to fix our smartphones. So we are entitled to rely at a level of product liability and consumer protection on basic assurances that the things are, uh, we buy are going to work the way we reasonably expect them to work. They're not going to harm us. They're not going to betray us. Uh, similarly, the idea of choice, uh, in, in the uh, pre-industrial economy, if you wanted to sell your labor for one dollar a day, you could do that. Um, and the law said, well, people choose to sell their labor in, in horribly unsafe working conditions in factories for a dollar a day, and that's just, that's just freedom. That is, that is workers uh, selling their labor at the price the market reflects. We, we got rid of that. We have workplace safety. We have minimum wage laws. We have maximum hours laws. We can argue about whether the minimum wage is too high or too low or whether the regulations are too onerous or, or not restrictive enough. But the basic idea is people should be able to live in a society they can trust. They should have jobs where they can trust they're not going to be seriously injured through no fault of their own. Uh, and and uh, the, the employees have their back, the, the employers have their backs. In the specific context of the digital economy, I, I think in order for us to trust the companies that are processing our data, we need to impose four duties upon them. First of all, companies need to be honest. And this isn't they bury things in the fine print. They have an affirmative obligation to tell us the things we need to know at the times we need to know them. Second obligation is, they have to be discreet. They, they can't be sharing our data willy-nilly. Sometimes sharing our data is necessary, right? Amazon needs to know our home address to send us packages of socks, whatever it is we buy on Amazon. Um, but widespread data sharing, you know, the idea that, that when we share data or they collect data on us, it's theirs forever, that's not being discreet. Um, third, they need to be protected. They need to protect us against data breaches. They need to protect us against harms that are foreseeable. Uh, and we place a, a duty of care upon them uh, to, to do that. And finally, I think ultimately, in order to trust a company, uh, we need to have some assurance backed by law that they're going to be loyal to us, that they are going to put our interests ahead of their own in the short term so we come back to them for business so that they in the long term are better off. So I think imposing duties of honesty, discretion, protection, and loyalty are, are the foundation. The goal should be that we can trust companies so that we don't need to read these ridiculously long privacy policies um, and, and offer fictitious consent to these practices. We don't understand the, the law, we don't understand the legal terms, we don't understand the technology, and we don't understand the consequences of what agreeing would mean, so we actually can trust these services so we can get on with our lives, which after all is the point of these things, are supposed to make our lives easier rather than more perilous and more complicated. Thank you. One question uh, is, uh, since all of this data and information has already been collected on each one of us, what about a law that allowed us relatively convenient access to the information that government and the private sector have and give us an opportunity to delete information <laughs> that we wish had not been collected I think this is roughly similar to a, uh, what in France is called le droit à l'oubli, 
the right to be forgotten, and that's the way it would work. <laughs> a good idea or a bad idea? So there's, there's a lot in there, and part of it, it relates to the right to be forgotten, and part of it doesn't. So there's one question about what are our rights, and what are individual rights, or what should individual rights be to know or to have access to what information is out there in the hands of the companies. Um, and that this is something that California is pushing um, through its new Privacy Act. Um, it's, it's this right to have access to this information. I think it's a great idea. I also think the reality is, is that most of the time, most of us are not gonna be in a position to do the kind of tracking and monitoring to make that right be really a meaningful protection, which is why I favor the kind of approach that puts the responsibility and the burden on the companies as opposed to the individuals to be constantly tracking and accessing. And certainly it's a piece of that, and we need to have those rights in order to be able to, to hold companies to account. But it's just not realistic to think that that's, um, that all of us are going to be able to track, monitor, um, note, um, be aware of where all of our data is, or even who are all the different entities to ask to figure that out. Um, so that's one thing. The right to be forgotten is something very different. The right to be forgotten arose out of a case between Google and France um, in which, well, it didn't, it didn't arise out of that. The, the right to be forgotten um, was, was announced in a European Court of Justice case in which the European Court um, concluded that individuals have a right to go to search engines, this is how it originally um, was, was raised before the European Court, and tell the search engine that this piece of information about me is embarrassing, I don't want it to be associated with the search of my name, and so therefore it has to be de-indexed. It arose out of a situation in which um, a, a man in Spain was concerned about the fact that every time you typed into his name, it showed an old foreclosure on his home um, and some unpaid debts that had subsequently been dealt with, and it was in, impeding on his ability to start a new business and kind of start over economically. He um, won all the way up to the European Court, and the European Court, as I said, imposed on Google this obligation to basically implement this right. And so what it means is that in Europe, individuals can go to search engines, which is mostly Google, Google's a search engine of choice, and say to the search engine, yes, this information about me is true, but I don't really want it up there. I don't want it up there when people search my name. Please de-index it for my name. If Google agrees, it gets de-indexed. Uh, Google's gotten millions and millions of requests about this. Um, they've de-indexed about half uh, or a little bit more. Um, and um, as it's been applied to date, generally the underlying information is still available online. It's just not available in connection with the linking of the person's name. Um, there's another case that's now pending before the European Court of Justice where France is saying, um, so, so to, to back up for one second, when Google implemented this, or now when Google implements it, it makes the information unavailable if somebody from Europe is searching a, it's the particular name. So if, so if I've successfully invoked the right to be forgotten with respect to some information about something I did in high school, if you search my name from anywhere in Europe using geoblocking, that information will not come up. If, however, you search my name outside of Europe, then the information remains available. Um, France is saying that this doesn't go far enough, that Google ought to take it down so it's inaccessible wherever anybody searches um, the individual's name, my name. And Google's saying no, that that creates a real risk that one country can set and impose a set of rules governing what is and is not permitted online and then impose it around the world requiring us to take it down or de-index it everywhere. It's a really interesting question that's up before the European court. Um, this is, I think I'm realizing I'm now far afield from what um, Peter originally asked. The question is, should we have a right to be forgotten in the United States? We can't really consistent with our First Amendment. I don't support it, but I do support certain aspects of it. So there are a number of initiatives, local initiatives, to do something called ban the box, which prohibits employers from being able to ask about criminal records before when somebody goes in to, to try to get um, 
a job under the idea that people do deserve second chances and sometimes our things in our past can follow us for the rest of our lives. But for a variety of reasons, I do not support the right to be forgotten, at least here in the United States. Okay, last, uh, you have the last word, Neil. Could you, could you address the, uh, whether or not you think the, something along the lines of the French right to be forgotten should be ad adopted in, in the American legal system? Sure, the, uh, I think it's gonna be, well, it, it's complicated, right? So, so we already have in, in the United States something like the right of access. Uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act allows you to get a copy of your credit report and to complain if things are inaccurate. Now, one of the problems with access rights is how do you access this data? You, you go on your computer, you type in a password. Um, that's a security risk as well. One of the problems with the Experian breach um, is when you create rights of access uh, for consumers to access their data, that's an additional security vulnerability. Now, I don't think that's necessary, necessarily one that requires us to eliminate rights of access, but, it, but it's, a, it's a consideration. There's another unintended consequence that comes from rights like the right to be forgotten, uh, which is that who do you think the people who use the right to be forgotten the most are? <laughs> it's usually populist politicians trying to, to delist negative press coverage of them or celebrities or other powerful people who, uh, you know, the, the, the financier in the news right now for sort of sexual abuse allegations, I'm not saying that he's doing it, but people who fit that profile hire media firms who put out a raft of right to be forgotten requests um, to try and uh, tweak or adjust their, their search results. So, so these things are, are subject to to manipulation. Um, I, I agree with Jenna. I think a broad, a, a narrow right to be forgotten of right and access and deletion and, cor and correction is feasible in the United States. And we have things like this. We seal juvenile records of, of juvenile offenders, right? So, so we have things like this, but a broad French style view I think is, is inconsistent with, with commitments to a free press, particularly with respect to celebrities. We could have a right to be forgotten for ordinary people, perhaps, but when we start to extend the right to be forgotten to celebrities and politicians, we start to, to risk incurring really severe consequences to our democracy. Well, let me say, what, you said I have the final word. One more point on this. One word. The big trend here in access, in right to be forgotten, in notice and choice, is a trend in consumer protection in our society, which I think is really, really problematic, and that is, the digital world promises labor saving, but it places additional worries and labors upon individual consumers to remember your passwords, um, to pay your bills online and check them because you don't get paper bills anymore. Um, when when, when we, we booked our flight to come here, we, we had to use Southwest, which is the worst on this, um, where we have to remember, we book our own flights and find the times, and then you have to a, a, a 24 hours before your flight's gonna happen, you've gotta, you've gotta check in, and even if you buy the extra thing, you still have to check in to be not, not at the back, and then you gotta find your seat, and we, pl we talk in terms of consumer empowerment, whether it's, whether it's uh, Facebook or whether it's airlines. Um, in, in the digital, digitally mediated modern economy, we are placing so much work upon individual consumers that notions like choice, that notions like diligence, that notions like responsibility become infeasible because we are trying to remember 900 passwords um, and uh, and, and various other things. So I, I think ultimately what we do need to do is, is what I said at the end of my presentation, we need to develop reasonable norms for consumer protection in a data-driven economy that protect us as consumers and that protect us as citizens so we can trust the economy in which we're trying to live our lives. Because after all, the purpose of this, and the GDPR talks about this, is technologies are supposed to serve humankind and not the other way around. And I think we have, we have gone too far in the direction of, of making all of us responsible for all of the, the many things in our lives and, and, and blaming us when, when we, we drop one of the many plates or digital plates we're required to spin. So I think the ultimate solution is developing reasonable principles that enable us to trust these technologies um, and so that they ultimately do more good for us um, than, than, than bad and exposure to risk. So we've reached the end of our time. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, members of the audience, for your patience and also for your participation in submitting questions. We didn't have a chance to get to all of them, but they were
Uh, we very much appreciate them. And I also would like to especially thank our two panelists, Professor Daskal and Professor Richards, for an extremely informative and thought-provoking presentation today. Thank you.